Have you ever had someone not take you seriously? Maybe they either underestimated your ability or your sincerity. Maybe they thought you were joking or just weren't, re weren't a relevant voice to listen to. There's been a good example of this crop up in so on social media this past week. Because in the opening week of the Tokyo Olympics, this picture drew some attention. As seems to always be the case on social media, there's countless people queuing up to offer their two pennies worth and feign an air of authority as they sat in their armchairs and criticised it from a distance. Comments like this started appearing. However, unfortunately, apart from the undoubted expertise and competence of these critics, this picture was not taken of some inexperienced amateur. No, in fact, it was of the Olympic gold medalist, who I think it's probably quite safe to assume is more informed on the subject of pistol shooting than self-proclaimed experts on the internet. Now, what does pistol shooting have to do with our Bible reading today? Well, as I'm about to read, our, our passage picks up at a point in the Exodus story where Moses' repeated appeals to Pharaoh have been dismissed and ignored. Despite the numerous plagues that had already fallen upon Egypt, Pharaoh was yet to take Moses, or the God who he claimed to serve, seriously. Let's read the passage now from Exodus 11 verses 1 to 10. It says this. Now the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbours for articles of silver and gold. The Lord made the Egyptians favourably disposed towards the people, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So Moses says, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go, out, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of all the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than it has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these people, all these officials of yours will come to me, bowing before me and saying, go and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. So that he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. Now, understandably, this can be one of those parts of the Bible that makes us feel a bit uncomfortable. In the shadow of this threat, this threat from God and from all the suffering that came about as a result of the plagues that came before it, I think it's quite easy for us to sit back and throw all kinds of accusations and judgments at God. This passage on its own is quite shocking. And so reasonably, we might find ourselves asking, how could God condone such a threat, let alone carry it out? And then how, how do we square that with the God of mercy we see revealed in Christ? As we explore this passage briefly, and as we consider what good might be gleaned from this Exodus passage, let us begin with prayer. Father, as we confront this challenging passage, help us to see who you are. May your Holy Spirit be with us this morning, guiding us to truth and opening our hearts to what you are longing to say to us today. Amen. Now, I think it's really important 
as we handle this passage, not to consider it in isolation from the rest of the story of God's people, or most importantly, from the beginning chapters of Exodus. Because in the first chapter of Exodus, we see a description of the oppression which Pharaoh had been laying upon God's people relentlessly. Not only were they subject to enforced harsh labour and ruthless treatment, but Pharaoh had become to feel so threatened by the Hebrews that he had decreed that all male Hebrew children be murdered immediately at birth. By this edict, Pharaoh had put the blood of a whole generation of Hebrew children on his hands. Now the sheer depth and scale of that kind of evil is unimaginable. No doubt we can all think of modern day atrocities which only evoke grief and horror when we're reminded of them. There is edict here to murder all Hebrew boys at birth. This Pharaoh's edict is at least on the same level as most of those other um, atrocities that we might think of. It was the murderousness and the harshness of Pharaoh's regime that was the whole reason why the Hebrews had been crying out to God. And it was the whole reason why God had just started to work through Moses to deliver his people from oppression. In bringing this plague upon Egypt, by the firstborn son of every Egyptian household being killed, God is almost directly mirroring Pharaoh's edict back at him. However, this isn't tit for tat, because unlike Pharaoh, there is a hint of mercy within the plague which God brought upon Egypt. Because the scale of this judgment is not without limit. Where Pharaoh sought to kill every Hebrew boy, this plague only took the firstborn Egyptian son. Where Pharaoh murdered out of fear and insecurity, God brought judgment out of righteous indignation. Where Pharaoh targeted God's people, God remembered his promise to his people and protected them from this plague. Now, of course, even with this context in mind, you might still find God's actions in this passage unpalatable. After all, I think we all know that when raising children, you frequently have to separate them brawling if they've got siblings. And when you do that, you, you always are quite quick to tell them that being hit by a sibling doesn't mean you're free to hit them back. Because inevitably, the accusations of who started it would start flying. So if we say that that's wrong with siblings, what makes God's reaction to Pharaoh different? Well, I think the difference in God's reaction to Pharaoh is the difference between retaliation and judgment. You see, retaliation comes from a place of malice. Retaliation is an unmerited, unmerited sense of entitlement to the suffering of another. It's filled with malice and it's concerned with making someone else suffer. But this is different from judgment, because judgment comes from a place of justice. It comes from a place of, it comes from a desire to see the depths of an offence acknowledged and addressed. Judgment is not concerned with suffering, the suffering of another in the way that retaliation is. Rather, it's concerned with maintaining the integrity of the boundaries between good and evil, with upholding and celebrating what is good, and identifying and rejecting what is evil. Retaliation is the ugly distortion of judgment, and it so often happens when fallen and sinful humanity take it upon themselves to act as the judge that only God has the right and qualification to be. So God's response here to put this plague upon Egypt is part of his just and righteous judgment upon them. A judgment that was warranted because Pharaoh was guilty, but a judgment that was also tempered by the grace, by grace enacted to deliver God's people from the hands of their oppressors. 
God's judgment was tempered by grace and it was enacted to deliver God's people from the hands of their oppressors. Now, I know that's all quite heavy. It's, I know it's all quite abstract. And it might leave you thinking, OK, Ben, but what does this have to do with me? Well, I want to put it to you that the mercy, the deliverance, the protection that God granted to the Hebrews by bringing them up out of Egypt and out of the hands of their oppressors is only a shadow of the abundance of mercy and blessing that God grants to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Where God, through Moses, delivered the Hebrews from a life of servitude to the Egyptians, God, through Jesus, delivered all those who come to him from a life of servitude to sin. Where God, through Moses, delivered the Hebrews from threat of pain and death, God, through Jesus, delivered all those who came to him from the finality of death, which is, after all, its sting. Where God, through Moses, hid the firstborn sons of the Hebrews by the blood of the Passover lamb. God, through Jesus, has hidden all those who come to him within his righteousness and with his blood, within his blood outpoured. This is incredible news for us. Because apart from Christ, we, like Pharaoh, are subject to God's righteous judgment. Because we, like Pharaoh, are guilty and we have sinned. But with Christ, we have been made free. By Christ's death, God's righteous judgment has been satisfied. And so we have been given a second chance. We have been given an opportunity. We have been given a new life. This is the freedom won at the cross. This is the prize which is ours to claim. Maybe you've never claimed it before, in which case we'll pray in just a moment as a way to do so. But maybe you've claimed it already. Maybe you're living your life in the freedom won at the cross. And that's fantastic. But I ask you, do you know the depths of God's mercy which you have received? Have you, like the Hebrews crossing out of Egypt, grasped the opportunity to live a new life free from servitude? Or are you willingly, or just apathetically, still living in your old life, but are still bowing to the command of sin, of rebellion against God, the command that sin once held over you? Before we pray, I want to close with these words from Romans 5. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died, died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, Shall we be saved through his life? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this story in Exodus and the way that it declares that you do not turn a blind eye to suffering or atrocity. And thank you that even though we, like Pharaoh, are guilty, you have made a way for us to come to you. You have protected us by the blood of your son and have made a way for us to find a second chance in you. Whether we have claimed it before or whether this is the first time, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, we will receive the freedom and the mercy won for us at the cross now. We ask that you will equip and aid us in living a new life with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.